Noble Eightfold Path. But this time we're going to take a closer look at the fact that the Noble Eightfold Path can be used in three different ways. It's the same path, but you're teaching it with the intention of three different intentions. And you know, if you've been a Buddhist for a long time, you probably realize this. If you if you were going to temple or going to Sunday school and then going to temple and then you started doing meditation, if you got into meditation more seriously, uh, you would find the third way was there too. So there's three different ways. So we're gonna take a look at this in the process of the foundation work. And um, there isn't a lot of recap in this. I don't see anybody really new to this, uh, what we're doing. So I'm gonna keep going without doing much of a, a recap, okay? And we'll just go through this and then we'll talk about it a little bit. So I'm gonna go into the document. So we call this, what is the Noble Eightfold Path times three? And, um, and basically it's just, what is the Noble Eightfold Path? But the times three is because there are three different ways of doing it. So first we have the word general there. <laughs> the general presentation of the Noble Eightfold Path is the community way. And when you have a church with a community or a temple with a community and you have the lay followers, you have a set way of putting it out for the community to use for the betterment of the people, uh, the betterment of the families, but the betterment of the community as well. So many of us have heard presentations of the Eightfold Path as we were growing up in our general communities. And this is how we usually hear the path teaching uh, in Sunday school first or at temple preached by the monks. And this is taught <coughs> for the general comfort of many people in one place. I have heard this given to very large gatherings um, with thousands of people there or in large tents across India. Once we did this this way for 10,000 people under a tent, another time 3,000 people under a tent. And it's a, it's a distinct thing people can identify with and try to remember it. And you can't say it enough times so that they really, really have it right inside them. This fold, uh, the first one, this is one way it's taught here is like wise view. And this is the, um, instead of right view, they would say wise view. And this fold <clears throat> is taught as a skillful means in life and unskillful means in life and learning the difference. It's unskillful to act through greed, anger, irritability, recklessness, envy, hatred, over eagerness and pride. And these things lead us to states of unhappiness. And it is, um, it is skillful uh, to practice generosity and kindness, humility, compatibility, joy, flexibility, and compassion to increase your happiness and the happiness of others. The second one, says wise resolve and a wise resolve it is helpful to keep a strong willpower to change from unwholesome thoughts states and actions and embrace the previous wholesome actions that lead to our happiness and the happiness of others the third one we say wise speech, abstaining from falsehoods and backbiting, divisive words, harsh speech, frivolous speech. We recognize this is tied directly into the precepts. And then comes wise actions, abstaining from violence and stealing, sexual misconduct, intoxicants, and these lead to multiple complications 
And then the fifth one is livelihood. Very specifically, practicing the six R's, completing uh, right effort. I'm sorry, do, do not sell meat, poisons, intoxicants, arms, ammunition, non-payment of your taxes, accepting bribes, stealing. These lead to unhappiness for yourself and others. This is a very practical approach that I've heard. Okay, and then wise striving is practicing uh, the completing of right effort, but only in support of the above factors, development and completion of this eightfold path. The seventh one is wise mindfulness. And this is taught to encourage paying attention to all the behavior, manners, and laws of your community in that context. And wise concentration, community, short meditation for the purpose of calming down the mind, for ceremonies, for meetings. Uh, this concentration is taught, one, for the purpose of restraint of the people in the community. Number two, for community training, for getting along in any kind of event or disaster or anything like that. And number three, for striving by abandonment of all that is unwholesome that causes problems in life releasing the unskillful and picking up the skillful. And everybody is working together with this in the community. And then number four, for your protection uh, from uh, disturbances and distractions in life, the four reasons for practicing the eighth one. So you see how this is a real general teaching. And we can see this, we haven't heard, seen the word wise in a lot of books, but all of a sudden, there it is. <laughs> and this use of the word wise is just the same as this is very wise for you to do this. It's the right way. And when we say the right way and wrong way, always remember not to think that somebody's saying we're right and you're wrong. Think of it as we are practicing something that makes it so our life operates well, just like we're taking care of the car by checking up on it when we're supposed to and operating it with the proper fluids the right way so it operates well. The Eightfold Path was meant to give to the human being so that they would have a, a structural, in, a, an instruction booklet of how to have the operation of life run as smoothly as possible. This is what it is, and it also is what supports the meditation too. Now let's look at the second one. How to use the noble, this is good, the eight rolled path, but we'll change that to an F. <laughs> we can roll the eightfold path, make sure we have rolled it properly. Okay, <laughs> that means kept it. Um, Noble Eightfold Path for major support of your meditation. Now we look at it more closely in, in the angle of seeing it. How does it support the meditation? So the Noble Eightfold Path specifically in support of meditation development is the way we're looking at it now. The second way that we look at this Noble Path is specifically meant for meditation development and fulfillment of reaching path knowledge, it's pertaining uh, pertaining to the tranquil wisdom insight meditation, so it operates correctly. So the first one, we take, I want you to, I don't believe in just dismissing the old way of saying it because it's out there so much. You run into it all the time. So like the way I like to say it, the right view is the first one, is practiced as harmonious perspective. This is precisely what it means. So we're going into the more precise meaning of how this, this operates. So a perspective is how you look at the world. We choose our own perspective habitually 
for here and now, how we're going to see what's happening. This is our choice. A positive perspective helps us live with peak performance for body and mind. And this is a major key in living a happy life. And you'll notice happy life. Happy life is a byproduct of the front part of this sentence. Let's see, I'm into the byproduct of happiness right now. Well, I had a lot of people last week talk to me about, I want happiness. I have to have happiness. I need happiness. If only I was happy. And they're missing the main point of how to be happy. You see, because happiness is not the product that you want. Happiness is the byproduct of how you live. And that's what you have to really learn and keep inside yourself, okay? It's important for body and mind to lighten up and stay strong in a crisis. Don't take things personally uh, because if you, it will only weigh you down. It gets heavy the moment you start with over concern, it makes you tired and you, you know, you get a heavy feeling in your head and you don't want to work. Never mind more often if we're using the never mind game, just never mind it um, and smile. Remember Anicca. Why is this so important to remember Anicca? Because Anicca means impermanence. What's well, a big word? What does that mean? It means everything changes all the time. And it also, in the Buddhist uh, texts, they like to say everything has a beginning, it has a middle, and it has an end. They're demonstrating what Anicca says every time you catch that in a sutta. Things keep changing all the time. So no matter how bad it is, the job they asked you to do. You can do it if you just keep in mind that it has this beginning, middle, and end, and keep going with a smile through it. You can do it. The second one is right thought. Right thought is practiced as harmonious imaging. Uh, so right thought a thought is an image, and what we're saying is anytime you look in your mind, you're carrying an image in there. When something happens, the first thing flies up a picture in your mind, okay? So by smiling, when a negative thought arises, in a pinch, uh, we can choose to just never mind it, relax, and bring up an opposite positive smile. Mind is the forerunner of all states, and we are testing this constantly. Is that true? Is it true? By continually retraining our mind to keep positive thoughts first in mind. And in our mind, uh, you should be remembering Anicca. Again, everything changes, nothing stays forever. And so smiling lightens the mind and sharpens the awareness. These are the two effects of the smiling. It lightens your mind and it sharpens your awareness for clearer mindfulness observation. And what are you trying to do with your mindfulness observation? You're attempting to get sharp enough to detect the change in the tension and tightness so that you can use that never mind. You can use that never mind faster and earlier by detecting it. That's why I like to say I'm discovering this over here a lot that the Vipassana uh, practitioner who's been paying attention to the feeling in the body and all different parts of the body as they're practicing and studying and things, that person, if they can transpose that sensitivity to just knowing what to do the moment they detect it. They don't have to leave the meditation and go to the body part or something until it's gone. But if they would just use the never mind there, bingo, it works. Whenever the urge arises for unwholesome speech, never mind. Hold your tongue. So my grandmother would say, hold your tongue. <laughs> hold your tongue. Relax instead and keep smiling lightly for success. 
Speech is the divine opportunity for the word carrot. Okay, my uncle, <laughs> he was in the Navy in World War II and he came out of it to teach all of us. Um, Navy is renowned for producing people who say some pretty harsh things um, or amongst themselves on the boats and everything. And he came out to teach his children the moment that you want to say something <laughs> out loud, you say, carrot, like that. And that's the first step of giving up saying the other word or any other expression. And it worked pretty well for him. So he taught the kids, my cousins. So personal retraining of your mind must go on all the time for it to change direction and become automatic. At the core, every smile is practicing good form of communication with an impersonal perspective. And this is so important. All the forms of communication will grow stronger with mind, speech, and body as you practice, if you just keep smiling. That's what you need to be doing. Okay, number four, harmonious movement of mind's attention. Right action is that first way of looking at this, talking about just the actions you do broadly in life, but, and it's on, it's unwise to be doing that, you know, to just react and you get in trouble that way. So we're talking about harmonious movement. One more level up, the movement of mind's attention. So we're taking you up a notch in how we're asking you to think about this eightfold path. Each time you never mind what you hear or see and you smile. You are reminding yourself to keep mind's attention in an impersonal perspective. Keep a mindful observation of mind's attention going. Keep practicing. Great effort and keep, by remembering to never mind, relax, smile, and come whenever there is a rise in tension and then keep going. Come back and keep going. You. You simply never mind unwholesome mind states and you always replace them with wholesome mind states, keeping your smiling and a light mind going as much as possible, keeping your inner smile alive and well, like it's a part of you that needs to be trained to come out more and more. So this one is really important because this one is pointing right to the mind and the mind is the forerunner of all states. So we're saying, let's take it on its word and start training to see exactly what mind is doing. And you can notice this, you can learn, but you have to know what you're looking for. Okay, number five is right livelihood traditionally. And that's kind of confining, you see, in practice. But if we look at how am I going to succeed at my meditation? If I'm not a monk, how am I going to do it? Well, you have the power of setting up whatever, wherever you're living in a little bit different way so that you have a corner somewhere that's somewhere that you can sit, even in a very modest little house that's a two-room house in the front yard if there's one tree and there's a bench by it. You can set up with your family. If I have, you know, I have this scarf over my head, don't come talk to me. <laughs> That's my private spot. And I'm in that private spot if I'm there like this. It's simple. So even if you tell me I don't have a room or a closet or anywhere I think I can go, there's a little spot somewhere you can develop in your life style of living where you have a tiny place that is your spot where you can be alone to process things. Harmonious lifestyle. Taking the time to smile and giving it away, it supports a positive living situation. That's the first thing. This life continuum lesson 
is really important here so that you live life in the present time. Life continuum lessons, when I teach you the line with the past, the birth, death, past, future, and you're in the present time vehicle, <laughs> the little car. Okay, I'm thinking of getting a little uh, like Ferrari or something. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to put there. This has to do with developing the new positive habit of smiling and gently saying, never mind, inside and laughing more whenever the past or future creep in and and disturb you. They they catch you, you know. And in all situations in life, you want your smiling to support your daily life. If you're smiling, you know, there's that song. If you're smiling and you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. That's a good old song. That's a good Buddhist song. <laughs> you had to look for songs. One time, Dr. Punaji said, I will listen to other music if you can tell me that it has Dhamma in it. I went back through all the songs I used to sing. This is before I was a nun. And I could only find certain songs that would fulfill his requirement <laughs> because we would, I would take the monks to visit places, museums and stuff. He would bring tapes so we didn't have to turn the radio on, see? And so I was wondering, will he never listen to a modern song? But a lot of our modern songs are not good news. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's not, not so easy to find one that um, is not putting people down or just in sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair because she went away. <laughs> Oh my, <laughs> and then you go on and on like that. You have country western. And um, the, it's an interesting phenomenon when you look at music about like that, because Brazilian love songs and Cuban love songs, they, they actually, romantic songs don't spend time lamenting. They, they spend time rejoicing that they were in the present time and they had love in their life and wasn't that beautiful. And now we go on. And that was a big difference, you know, from American and some of the European attitudes towards this. So every culture has a different way of, of looking at this sort of thing. Um, so this is about letting things go more easily and developing patience and compassion for others. Uh, the strongest lifestyle and positive thinking is what supports that. And also it is setting up a lifestyle. So it's a lifestyle instead of just your occupation that we're looking at in a broader sense, because if you're going to go and spend time developing your practice outside of retreat, we want you to be able to understand that you can do that, but you have to set yourself up to support yourself. And of course, here's right effort number six, harmonious practice. Um, and it's four steps of right effort. And the big lesson here, whenever you repeat these to yourself, the biggest part of it to remember is one and two doesn't cut it. It doesn't change anything for you. So if you believe I say change your mind, you will change your life. You're not going to change your mind unless you are practicing all four of the pieces of right effort. That's just a fact. And it's very much confirmed. This fact is very sealed and tight in the, the, the uh, psychological community and, you know, psychiatric community and different styles of looking and all this stuff. You've got to, to do all four steps to replace an old habit and get a new habitual tendency going in your life. And one man said to me a long time ago, he said, that's awful what you're teaching. I said, why? He said, you're saying you're going to let go of habitual tendencies from the past and you're going to invent more habitual tendencies. I don't want any habitual tendencies in my life, he said. And I thought for a second and then I said, well, then you may as well give up. Nothing can ever change. You're absolutely stuck. 
because in order to change, you have to retrain your brain. And so this is especially important to know that one and two have to do with purifying the brain by letting go of the old, unhealthy, unskillful, unwise pieces, and then replacing them every time the exact same way because you're training a brain and brains learn that way. So you do it in the same pattern every time until it just clicks and starts doing it by itself in the right effort turns into right striving. So number one in the right effort, seeing mind is caught by an unwholesome thought, feeling and thinking first, you should say never mind as you number two, let go of that unwholesome thought feeling and you're relaxing and forgiving yourself. Don't punish yourself. Don't say, well, now I have to stop and I had to punish myself and look at how silly I was that that came up. Don't do that. But then the most important part is the second half of the practice, the second half of it. Smiling as you remember it's actually relaxing and, and smiling uh, as you remember Anicca, as you redirect the lighter mind back to the wholesome object. It can be metta, it can be, or sending this in the direction of that person with a smile when you're working with the metta, karuna, and such. Or you come back to your task in the same way and you make a commitment to the task. It has a beginning, has a middle, has an end. So you keep going with a smile in it until you get finished. Keeping that meta smile and lightness going and keeping an impersonal perspective. And you also bring up more things that feel that way that are positives and build on that. And that's how you create a new habit. And what I said to the man basically is all human beings live and exist with habits. You have to get a notebook and start writing down what are your habits. And then if you want to change them, you go on and change them, but you can't change them to nothing. You see, the illusion here with Westerners coming to Buddhism is sometimes, you know, I'm going, I, I hear this will make the bring happiness. I want my happiness. They go that way. Another one is, I will simply, I have the solution, I will stop feeling. <laughs> and then no craving will come up. That's a dead end. Because the only one that can let go of all that craving is the arahat, is at that level, you see? So you, you need to learn how this works and then let it go and through the process, let the clinging go because you understand what it is. Let, stop choosing a past habit of reacting anymore and then stop giving birth to it. So first you stop hitting back, shouting back, going back against whatever it was. Then you realize it came out of a library, you lock the library door, <laughs> get a big padlock in your mind, put it on, close your library of habitual reactions that are inside that library. Then you give up clinging. You can do all of that. And then all you have left is craving. And you can laugh at craving when it hits. Don't beat yourself up. And then go past it for the time being until you get as far as you can. And you can really, really reduce it out. Thus, you have proven what the Buddha said to Ganaka Mogalana, okay? That he teaches a gradual teaching with a gradual practice, with gradual progress. And in Buddhism, what progress is, the suffering that's being caused by craving. So it's happening. He's telling you it's going to be less and less and less and less and less until it's gone. That's what he's telling you. But it's not going to come in a box for 1995, and there it is. <laughs> it doesn't happen that way. Let's be real. That's not how it works, okay? 
So the this one now, the next one is the right mindfulness. Did we do this one or we have to do this one, right? Right mindfulness. This is number seven, harmonious observation. And our observation is not just staying with one thing and trying to watch one thing. Our observation is of what's happening in that present time, in that spot, in that present time. Okay, that's what you're trying to do. As you smiled, your mind remembered the nature of mind's attention. When it's light and smiling, it remembers how this feels versus when tension and tightness arises and mind gets heavy and serious and pulled down. Notice how when you are caught by this, it is a painful in your mind and it's in your heart, in both places, mind and heart. And remember what to do. It's remembering what to do, that mindfulness. Remembering to practice the cycle of the four steps of right effort and to do all of them, not just to practice your cycle and keep smiling. Right concentration is the last one, and we say it is completed by practicing harmonious collectedness. And thus, when we teach you, we must remind you when you hear us say unified mind, it doesn't mean this kind of unified mind that is a hardcore absorption type thing that you want to get like that. No, no. Harmonious um collectedness is a unified mind. It means a productive level of concentration. That's what it means, not more, not less, productive level. And what does that mean? It means it's a supportive concentration that will support you to reach path knowledge and get on the path and start going down through your jhanas more easily as it's described in the text. So it's a level, a productive level of light concentration, collected or unified mind. It keeps the practice running smoothly. Mind is alert, calm and composed. It is able to stay with the moment as you're in the, med in the meditation moment or your task in life in the present time without distractions or heaviness arising to pull it away. That's what's important. Okay. Smiling and laughing more easily in life is what's coming out of this. This path, the way we've read it now, is the major part of construction that tells you this is built to support your meditation and make it run well. Okay.